I was unhappy to be awake and working at 4.30 in the morning, and I didn't feel like dealing with the cat, which continued scratching around underneath the imposing black TV armoire in the corner of our living room. Gwenny! My boyfriend David and I have three cats, but I yelled at Gwenny, a.k.a. Guinevere of Camelot because she's the most likely to scratch and scramble around at odd times in odd places. Our other two cats are named Sparrow, whose name contradicts his girth, <laughs> and Merlin. Merlin's only magical abilities include styling my boyfriend's hair with his tongue, <laughs> sprawling across the computer keyboard, and consistently failing to jump high enough for a graceful landing. David likes to say that Merlin missed some mandatory classes on how to be a cat. I'd ruled out Merlin as the scratcher because he was sitting on the side table next to me with his head shoved up inside a wide-brimmed lampshade. It wasn't Sparrow either. He'd already waddled down to the basement in search of food. Scritch, 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 Gwenny! I was about to get up and haul Gwenny out from under the armoire when Gwenny sauntered downstairs head and tail held high, bright yellow eyes glaring at me as if to say, stop yelling at me, lady, I'm right here. Crap. Those sounds weren't Gwen. Some stupid mouse must have decided our house was a good place to make a nest. My mind raced. How do I get the mouse out of the house alive? May maybe I could let the mouse be and wait until David woke up? The cats didn't seem that interested in the scratching sounds, and David wasn't trying to meet a deadline for work. But what if the mouse got brave and tried to scurry across the floor? I wasn't exactly thrilled a mouse had invaded our house, but I was more distressed I'd witn witness our cats dumbly batting the terrified creature around like a hockey puck. Plus, my six-year-old stepdaughter Sophia was asleep upstairs and I envisioned her morphing into a child-sized version of the scream if she woke up to find the cats torturing a half-dead mouse. I also didn't want to wake my mother, who just happened to be in town for a visit. My mother is the savior of every animal she's ever had the chance to rescue. The baby bunny she pulled from the jaws of a husky, the cowering terrier she snatched from its owners, and the writhing mass of kittens she found under a friend's porch. She stopped traffic for turtles and fashioned temporary bird nests in cardboard boxes. Even bugs got scooped into paper cups and returned to the great outdoors. There was no girly yelling about spiders in our house. It's my mother's fault that I was even trying to save the stupid mouse. Most people would have just gone to buy a trap. I needed to solve the mouse problem before Sophia or my mother woke up. The scratching sound interrupted my thoughts. A nose appeared, long and thin, and not little enough to be a mouse. Fuck. <laughs> it was a possum, sizing me up with her beady little eyes. My anxiety level surged at the thought of bleeding cats and bleeding bank accounts. I'd heard possums could get nasty. I knew I needed David's help, but didn't want to leave the cats alone in case the possum tried to attack them. I headed toward the bottom of the stairs and used my best stage whisper to get David's attention. David! David! Wake up! Get down here! There's a possum in the house! David slowly trudged out of the bedroom, eyes half opened. What? He asked. There's a possum behind the TV. Come help me get the cats. I grabbed Sparrow and locked him in the laundry room where his howls would be less likely to wake Sophia and my mother. David quickly quarantined Gwenny and Merlin in our bedroom. I was somehow certain the possum was trying to escape, so I opened the screen door wide. Then David and I curled up on the couch, watching and waiting for it to leave. I tried to work, but lost focus every time the possum made a sound. 
I should probably mention that the possum had found her way into the house because our most industrious cat, Sparrow, had fashioned himself a cat door by ripping a hole in the screen to our back patio. David had replaced the screen once, only to find a new cat door by Sparrow the next day, so we left it. This mutually beneficial arrangement allowed the cats to come and go as they pleased during the summer months without having to yowl for human assistance. It had never occurred to us that other creatures might find our open door hospitality equally appealing. We sat and waited. The clock ticked towards 6 a.m. before the possum reappeared. Her nose, twitching to assess possible danger, was followed by a paw with five finger-like toes and claws. Another howl from Sparrow, and the possum retreated. A few minutes later, the possum reemerged and darted behind a chair almost halfway to the door. David and I sat very still. Sparrow must have resigned himself to his laundry room prison because he stayed quiet, too. Finally, the possum peeked out from behind the chair and scuttled out the open door. Success! No more possum. <laughs> when Sophia woke up, she was disappointed to learn she'd slept through such excitement. My mother barely acknowledged that I'd solved the problem without death or drama. Jessica, it's not safe to leave the door like that, she scolded. You should really repair the screen. Uh-huh, I said, hoping the conversation would die. My mother continued fretting over the cat's safety while I tried my best to look busy. She seemed to forget that a possum family had invaded her back porch to get our cat's food when I was a kid. She hadn't made a big deal about it. She just stopped putting cat food on the porch. The more my mother worried, the more annoyed I got. Hadn't I just shown my mother that I could handle a little wildlife in my living room? A few weeks later, David headed out to a bachelor party for a friend. I put Sophia to bed and curled up on the couch with my computer. Merlin, the magically inconvenient, was lying across my wrists, making it hard to type. And Gwen and Sparrow were off lurking about when I heard the familiar scritch, scritch, scritch. Damn! I left the door open while putting Sophia to bed. But this time, I knew exactly what to do. I locked up the cats, opened the screen door, and returned to the couch, prepared to sit very still. I left a message for David, asking him to come home at a reasonable hour. I wasn't scared to be alone with the possum. I just didn't want it living in my house. Unlike my mother, I'd opted for a more traditional relationship with the animal kingdom. When a stray cat showed up on my doorstep, I fed it and gave it water, but felt okay letting it live outdoors. I'd waffled between killing and simply deterring mice. I saved spiders and bumblebees, but had no qualms about killing other insects. I was hoping the possum would leave on its own, because the possum management strategies I'd found on the Humane Society website didn't give me much hope. One, make sure possums don't get in in the first place. <laughs> Two, close up any holes to prevent the possum from re-entering. Three, if the possum doesn't leave, gently nudge it outside with a broom. <laughs> I decided to wait for David. Three hours later, the possum had not budged, and I began to panic. What if she was making a nest for her babies in our furniture? What if I tried to push her outside and she bit me? What if the possum had rabies? Maybe I wasn't prepared to handle a possum prowling through the house. I left another message for David. I also sent a text saying, possum in house again, please call. Several more calls and texts went unanswered. Sometime after midnight, with the possum still ensconced beneath the armoire, David called to say he was going to sleep off the festivities for a bit, then come straight home. Okay, I could get through this. I was still waiting for David when the possum emerged and headed for the open door. Score one for me. I was a wildlife management pro. <laughs> Score one for the possum, too. She suddenly hooked a right turn and made a beeline for the basement stairs. 
Where was she going? I grabbed the kitchen broom and gingerly stepped downstairs to see where their possum had disappeared. A rustling sound emanating from the bulging bag of cat food re <laughs> revealed her destination. It slowly dawned on me. The possum knew exactly what she was doing. She must have discovered the cat food on a previous visit. After all, we'd been leaving the door open day and night for months. Could that be why the cats hadn't reacted to the scratching sound underneath the TV? Maybe the possum had fooled them into thinking she was just another cat. David eventually got home around 3.30 a.m. and dutifully hauled the bag of cat food still containing the possum into the backyard. <laughs> the possum, probably full from its gourmet meal, grudgingly crawled out of the bag. I let Merlin and Gwen out of the bedroom. I also freed Sparrow, who, who had nearly shredded a hole in the laundry room door. David closed the sliding door and we went to bed. Cooler weather made it easier to keep the doors closed, and we didn't see the possum again. But that didn't keep the wildlife outdoors. Two weeks later, I opened the door for Gwenny, who promptly dropped a bird at my feet. Stunned but unharmed, the bird took flight and immediately crashed into the living room window. For the third time in less than a month, I quarantined all three cats. Then I dashed around the house, covering windows and opening doors, so the bird wouldn't kill itself trying to escape. By the time the bird finally perched in the doorway between our living room and dining room, I knew I needed to call an expert. Mom, <laughs> got any ideas for getting a bird out of the house? While I've come to terms with my traditional relationship with nature, my stepdaughter Sophia remains enthralled by the idea of wild animals in the house and regularly begs me to tell the possum story to anyone who will listen. Maybe she'll be the, next, the family's next animal savior. Thank you, Jessica.